So we continue with Rick from Hopper. Come on stage, come on stage. Um, I was in Protocol Berg in Berlin, so I kind of knew what they're planning to do, uh, which is super cool. And I think that uh, if that uh, will be the topic of the talk, I like that these guys are thinking about how to make privacy pretty mainstream and not that high bro, so lots of the people who have, I guess, wallets, could access privacy that's like that. And I think that's what's one of the biggest challenges, how to make privacy tangible and not that complex. So you should care about the full stack privacy first to have some sort of the best of the best. We should start something. And once PG is connecting, maybe you will do intro about the company and stuff like that. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much much for inviting me. Hello, my name is Rick. I am one of the two co-founders of Hopper. And by the end of this talk, you're going to have $300 more in your bucket, indirectly. <laughs> how, how do you make 20 people stay in a room? <laughs> you start to give freebies away, especially in a bear market. Good. Um, before we get started, um, very quickly, I'd love to know you a little bit better, although this is a privacy conference, but I'm going to ask, you know, very lame questions. So, um, who actually is from Italy? Somewhere in Italy. So, the rest is from somewhere in the world? Very international. Okay, super cool. Um, who of you is, this is the first, I mean, that's the second Web3 privacy conference. Um, whose second privacy conference is this? Okay, perfect. Um, do we have developers here, or who is a developer? 50-50, that's cool. Who of everybody here in the room is um, still in the Web 2, not being in the Web 3? Ooh, okay, everybody in the Web 3, this is going to be complicated for me. So, um, Vitalik said, off-chain privacy solutions are needed in Singapore. Um, that was a really nice event and a really nice statement. So, perfect uh, for us in order to get started. Um, privacy itself. I know that I'm on a privacy conference, but I can't say it often enough because I think this is a, this, privacy itself is a really a weird momentum. And it's a weird word and it's a weird feeling. Um, we have over a dozen nationalities in our Hopper team, and uh, we talked about privacy, and we I think we emotionally understand all more or less the same, but at the end of the day, um, if you translate it in your mother language, in your mother tongue, it doesn't mean really what we mean about it when we talk about it, the English word, and what we really mean about it, plus, I do believe it's this strange word which is different because it's one of these words which get a new meaning if we add the digital environment around us. So, privacy itself is very clear. If you're at home and you close the door, you close the windows, you're in a private environment. So, you choose to be private in that moment, unless there is no digital stuff around you. This is clear. Everybody understands this one. And the moment you invite guests, the moment you open the window and the neighbor is looking in, the moment you start a camera and a live chat, everybody knows, okay, this is now not private anymore. Because you're able to see it. You're able to grasp what's around you. This is visible. But in the digital world, it is not. In real life, you're able to simply close the freaking door and that's it. But in the digital world, what do you actually do for privacy? How, how? What, what's, the, you know, what's the button? What's the door to close it in order to say, okay, now I'm in a private environment in the digital world? So, tricky. You're all cozy, tucked into your bed at night, and then you have your iPhone or smartphone with you. Who of you has a social media account? TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Tinder, whatever. Or maybe the other way around, who hasn't? Good guy. <laughs> you have email? Got you. So, not socially. But this is a really strange feeling because the moment you touch your phone, you feel kind of safe, although it's not. It's not a private moment anymore. 
and you choose to share data very willingly, you know, you know, depending on the onboarding process step by step, but you share so many information about you. But you don't only share it with the ones you think you're sharing it. You're not only sharing it with Twitter or with Instagram. And if you post a picture or you state anything, and even if you choose, oh, only my friends, yeah, fuck off. This Every, the machine is a data learning machine in the background, and it sees and knows everything about you. So although you're only sharing with your friends, the service in the background, they get everything about you. And literally, they don't really care about the picture which you're posting with you and your puppy at home, and it's so nice, or that you're traveling that much, and it's so amazing. What they care about nowadays is the metadata, because it says so much more about you in so less data. So it's a strange feeling. And who cares about it? And why should anybody care about your data? Well, it's fucking boring. In the beginning, I was like, everybody can have my data, I don't care about it, because who would be that dumb and stupid to be interested in a lame guy from Switzerland? Well, there's a really good reason for it, because you're able to buy a $400 million yacht, or you are able to buy the houses around you because you don't like the privacy in Los Angeles, so you, you know, buy a little bit of the neighborhood. And that's the centralized web tool. What do you think is easier to touch your data and your metadata in a centralized world or in a decentralized world when you have so many peer-to-peer -peer connections? Now the question is, do you want to add privacy to these connections or do you just want to stay it open and share it with everybody on planet Earth? What do you think, how long will it take until these Web2 guys, which became billionaires, will come into the Web3 space because they discovered that there is more data? Data harvesting didn't even start, though, ha -ha, I really have a competitive advantage. Plus, it's much easier to get all your data. Now, coming back to how we started, um, this little weird thing where we do not have a connection to from your cell phone to these guys. How does the data get from there? Because it's invisible, you know, it's flying through the air, woohoo! So you, you know, it's not real life, I can't see it. Prove it. Well, yeah, you see it on the screen, but you can't see the data. You can't see the transport layer. You can't see where the data gets in and out, unless you look at a special app. So this data gets transferred via AT&T, T-Mobile, or, 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 or whatnot, and then, the same for the Web3. So you have your decentralized applications which need to write or want to write data on chain. How does it get on the chain? Yeah, well, it's the decentralized application which is sitting on the chain and that's it. Well, no, not really. There's a server, there's RPC calls, and so on and so on. So this data is transported via the transport layer. It needs to get there from A to B. It's not that these servers are next to each other or the one is sitting on top of the other. Now you might say, yeah, but I mean, they are all encrypting the data. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> not going back to Mr. Hayden from the NSA who said, like, we're pulling, killing people based on metadata. No, just thinking about what does it mean that WhatsApp is telling you that they're encrypting the data. That's funny, because think for one moment. You start working for DHL or any whatever packaging post center on planet Earth, and then um, you make a really big Excel sheet, and then you start, you know, Taking the first package, you're measuring it, the date and the time it comes in and out, um, the address where it came from, the address where it goes to, the, uh, the height and the weight, and then you unpack it and look what's inside. And it's like, hey, cool, um, an umbrella. Second package, oh, wow, cool, tennis racket. Third package, and so on. And you do that for really a good long amount of time. How long does it take you as a human being to tell everybody, after whatever, the 500,000th package, what's most likely going to be inside? Oh, it comes from this region in China, and it goes in that region in New York. Huh, okay, good, this, that, no, 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 no. This time of the year, most likely, it's going to be. And this is just for you as a human being. What do you think, how complicated it is, because me telling now encryption is like, you know, packaging the data or whatever it is. Nobody looks inside the package anymore, because the encryption is lame. What you're looking at is the data about the data. You're looking at the metadata. So nobody needs to read your emails anymore or look what puppy you are petting on that picture. And this is why Vitalik said we need more of chain privacy solutions. And this is why we started three and a half years ago um, the project called Hopper, 
which takes care of what we believe an important piece of infrastructure in the Web3 space. The Hopper protocol is live since August last year now and quickly telling you what we're doing in order to carve out the differences between a mixed network, which is decentralized, and maybe other solutions on the market, like a VPN or a proxy. So the first thing what we're doing, coming back to the DHL package, is DHL is sending these packages all in one goal. It's, I think it's really better that they do it that way, because if they would split it up into 100 packages and they would deliver it at your doorstop, you would be literally pissed, because that doesn't make a lot of sense. You can't do that with real life items, but you can do that amazingly with data. So you have some message and you want to send whatever message from A to B, like for example from Uniswap you want to buy something and um, have the transaction written on chain, then we take your package, we split it up into many indistinguishable packages, they all look the same, they're all very small, and then we send each part of this message through the mixed network via a different route. So even if somebody decrypts the package which you received, they'll see a part of it. So they see, you know, some, some numbers and some nice signs. What to do with it? Because you don't know if it's the first, the last part, the middle part, which part is it, where, where does it come from, and where does it go to? Now it gets really complicated to decipher what's in there. The second thing is packet mixing. So at each of these nodes, we're making it a little bit more complicated for all these people who would like to look at it by just mixing them. In reality, they're not yellow, blue and light blue, they're all yellow, but just to differentiate and show what we're doing here. And then the one thing which is unique and the USP of Hopper, we are doing um, proof of relay, that's what we invented. So everybody on planet Earth is able to run a Hopper node. Super easy, you're able to buy a Dapp node device or you're just able to download it by yourself and run it on the laptop. And if you would like to send data, just like DHL, you pay DHL, or in this time you pay the network in order to send the package. And the other way around, if you would run one of these hopper nodes and somebody would use your node in order to relay data via you, then you would earn money. So you would earn hopper token in order to send and receive these messages. And that's exactly what we call a transport layer, that's what some call a layer zero, and this is what Vitalik means when he says off-chain. So this is an off-chain privacy solution. And how does it fit into the entire game? Whenever data in, is in transit, so for example, there's many amazing ZK projects, like ZK Bob, for example, and there's something done or needs to be done on-chain, then you would be able to use Hopper and then write the data so that it's 100% full privacy stack and not just the 50%. Can I use a VPN? Sure. Just doesn't really help. We're in Rome. Traffic in Rome is amazing, so let me give you a little example. I showed you the mixed network of all these hopper nodes which are somewhere live on planet Earth and uh, you have these yellow packages which are running around. A VPN, um, to give you an example, is um, you have a blue car in order to go, you know, s s deliver one of these DHL packages from A to B. So you have a blue car. That's your IP address in the web world. In real world, it's a blue car. So you take this blue, uh, this blue car and you go from A to B. Is it hard to identify you? No, because everybody knows this is your IP address. This is a blue car. You go from A to B. I see you. Everything is nice. I see not what's in the car, but I can observe you. Fine. Um, a VPN changes your blue car to a black car. Congratulations. How much more difficult is it going to be for anybody to observe the black car? Same, same. Yeah. They say it's two milliseconds more complicated to get you. Fine. Um, what Hopper is doing, we're giving everybody in Rome a yellow car, and you have a black car, you arrive, and you say, I want to use Hopper too, you also get a yellow car. Now, in Rome, so much nice traffic, so many yellow cars, how funny is it going to be for anybody from the outside world to watch? Who's that boy, girl, heh? 
This is the difference between the Hopper Mix network and the VPN. And don't misunderstand me, VPNs are amazing. They're just 25 years old, the technology is old. But the idea was nice. In the Web3, and this is the problem which we're now getting to, we see the early onset of data harvesting. This is the ugly part about it. And in the last 12 months, this has costed all citizens of the Web3. Guestimations are around 1 billion US dollars. Sweet. How young is the Web3? And there is no real data harvesting happening. So this MEV, especially front running and sandwich attacks, cost every citizen of the Web3 already 1 billion US dollars. And if we're looking at this, what's happening, um, MEV today is rather kind to all of us. Why? Because it simply wants your freaking money. It's not like the algorithm in the Web2 space which wants to learn about your sexual preferences, your political opinion, how can I make you buy more of these Puma shoes, they're amazing, how can I influence you more in order to do this and that. Currently, Web3, MEV, front running and sandwich attacks, just your fucking money. Okay, that's nice. But if we're looking at it today, it's just the freaking snowflake on top of the iceberg because they're only looking at the Ethereum mempool. And this is not stopping. They just started to look at the order flow of CowSwap. And these Web2 boys and girls are not here yet. So this is really, really, really baby shit. About just $1 billion, so that's not so heavy. How can we change this? Well, very simply, one of these things is maybe that we try to realize or reflect a little bit more what privacy is. The metaverse is coming. Would you mind explaining me how privacy is going to be established in the metaverse? Oh no, but you're going online. I mean, it should be clear to everybody that you know this, this is visible to everybody and people are making money off your data. Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, it's not cool. Don't you think that in the digital world we should equally have the opportunity to say, no, this is private. This is a picture of me and my baby, and I only like to send this picture to my wife or my partner, and nobody else is able to see it. And no, I'm not printing it out in a black box and then, you know, getting a pigeon and bringing the picture, picture over there. If you really want to see how bad it is, we uh, have a little solution in order to make it a little bit transparent in the Web3 space, um, derp.hoppernet.org. Derp is the dump Ethereum RPC provider. So if um, you're all from the Web3 space, which is pretty amazing, I guess that everybody here has more than one wallet address. You know, one for salary, one for business, one really private, one super private aping account. Uh, the problem is only that your wallet, as well as your RPC provider, know all that shit. So although you're locked in into one of your wallet addresses and you would like to buy whatever, 500 hopper token or two ETH or whatever, your meta, your wallet is pinging all these, all these wallet addresses. And, you know, to make it really useful for all the people who would like to harvest the data, they're also pinging all the tokens and coins you have. And to make it really clever, because everybody needs to know, they're also showing the amount of tokens and coins you have. Why not? Why? Oh, funny, there was one thing I forgot, really not so important, but they're pinging your freaking IP address. So they're connecting your IP address with your wallet address, sys. It's, it's an opportunity. That's the reason why Hopper um, 
started with RPCH. So it's an RPC provider over Hopper, and it provides you with the first, very first time privacy when any RPC call. How does it work? For example, if you want to buy something in Uniswap, you're logging into your MetaMask. In the middle, you have RPCH, which is an adapter over the Hopper MixNet, and the data goes on chain. What would make an RPC provider, which is private, slightly better? What would you add to an RPC provider, which is private for the very first time? And you're able to use it in a better version if you are 50% developers, I guess 50% of you are able to download a Docker. I'm pretty sure. You're able to use it, set your own RPC uh, endpoint, and that's it. So it's pretty easy to use. But we're making it even nicer. So we're adding to this private RPC endpoint, we're adding propeller heads, MEV revenue share. So when you're using it, you get 100% MEV revenue share from back running your own transactions. So you get privacy and you get cash back. That's cool, even without Visa. Why? Sounds like a product promotion. Privacy is what we, are belie we believe makes the Web3 stronger. Because in order to establish censorship resistance, and credible neutrality. We need decentralization, and that's what we all know. But if we don't add privacy to these peer-to-peer -peer connections, it's going to be complicated. And the reason why we're all of us here is we all want to reach a state of freedom. So you would be able to go to degen.rpch.net or to make it super, super easy, you're able to scan this code and you're able to use the code word free privacy. And then you get six months of premium Degen RPCH in beta version for free, uh, worth 50 bucks a month. So 50 bucks times six months makes 300 US dollars. Whoever wants to grab it, feel free to grab your $300 free account, spread the world, and make the Web3 space a censorship resistant space full of happy people living in freedom. Thank you very much.